Uh, welcome everybody to the uh, latest Knowledge Network on Climate Assembly event. It's been a while since we've held a learning call and it's an absolute delight to have an opportunity to um, learn about the Luxembourg uh, Climate Citizens Assembly or the, in Luxembourgish, which is going to be a disaster, is the uh, Climate Bejero. Um, the uh, call is going to be focused on, we, we, I'm joined by four really interesting um, people who have very different perspectives on the process. Um, Tom, who is the director of uh, Petit Lens, Jeff, who is the chief of chart staff of the prime minister, Marion, who is a member, who was a member of the assembly and Raphael, who was a researcher at the University of Luxembourg. So we're gonna get lots of really interesting perspectives. I just want to tell you a little bit about the some, some background facts, some background to the assembly so we don't have to go through all of this with the with, with, with the um, uh, with the speakers. So the um, assembly was announced by the Prime Minister in his um, State of the Nation address in October 2021. And he announced that he wanted uh, the assembly to review Luxembourg's current commitments to combating climate change and develop possible measures or proposals that could feed into the updated National Energy and Climate Plan. And the National Energy and Climate Plan is a plan that's required by all member states of the, uh, of the European Union and which the, uh, has now been delivered in, uh, in, um, in recent months. And that's a really interesting um, example for us because it's a really clear relationship between an assembly and a particular moment in the policy cycle. And I think many of the assemblies we've looked at, that hasn't always been the case. Just a, another bit of background, the, um, the, the assembly had 100 participants. Initially, there were just gonna be 60 full members and 40 surrogate members, but in the end, they, they, they all formed the assembly. It was a bit of an odd um, sortition process, which involved random, random invitations, uh, members of a survey panel and also advertisements for open calls. So some really interesting um, combinations. Um, and the applicants had to be conversant in French, um, Luxembourgish and English, again, which is, which is a really interesting category. 91 members actually uh, finished the first part of the process and 63 voted at the end. And you'll notice there I said that there were, there were two parts of the process. And I think this is something we'll talk about particularly with uh, Tom and Marion about their experience of this. The first phase took place in January uh, to June, and then a second phase from July and August with the final vote happening in September. And just finally, there was a report that came out with a, which contained a forward and 56 recommendations, uh, which was presented to the Prime Minister, the Minister of Energy and the Minister of Environment in the middle of September. And since then, the um, Chief of Staff, who's joining us on this call, has been coordinating preparatory work to incorporate those proposals into the National Energy and Climate Plan. So we're going to be trying to capture as much of that, uh, to, to capture some of the really interesting learning from this process um, over the next um, hour and a half or so. And please um, do put comments or questions into the chat and we'll try, we'll try and get um, as many um, responses as we can. Um, my, um, we have a summary of the um, process on the um, uh, on the NOCA website, which will be shared in in the chat, which will give you some of the background information that I've just said. So, if I could be joined by Tom, that would be great. Um, uh, Tom um, is the um, one of the uh, directors of um, uh, Petilance, which was the um, organization which was commissioned to actually organize the assembly and I guess the the first question I've got to ask you Tom is that was a really tight time scale between commissioning and actually starting the assembly uh, how did you how, how did you manage that because uh, I'm assuming there was a there was a there was a tender that went out that you had to compete for that we're talking like what how long before the assembly started roughly one and a half months I would say I didn't didn't look it up now exactly on on, on the exact week, but uh, yeah, um, challenging but feasible. So it, it was very ambitious, um, but we 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 parallelized and we didn't have all. We were different um, companies or, or stakeholders, uh, so choosing the participants and and uh, choosing the locations were not my part. Uh, we were really focused on the the facilitation. Um, so there were different stakeholders, which 
also a short time frame makes it challenging to synchronize everybody but a little bit of stress of stress makes it also to be focused on the most important thing so it was <laughs> it was really uh, a prioritization and uh we were lucky, uh, the different partners, we knew each other, Luxembourg is small, so we collaborated on other projects, not that scope, uh, not, not uh, perhaps this size, um, but we already had a, a trust relation in between some of the key actors, so this, this made it possible. Nevertheless, uh, one or two weeks more uh, <laughs> could have been a benefit, but wouldn't have changed a lot on the, on the process, how it was going. So, so I actually want to ask you about the process, because I mentioned that there were two phases to the process, one which was, um, uh, you know, a first phase, as I understand it, where each weekend you looked at a particular topic within within the National Energy and Climate Plan and, yep. and then and then were developing, trying to develop proposals for that. And then you but then you just uh, well, you, you, you can tell us what happened, because then you decided that you actually needed a second phase, which originally hadn't been hadn't been planned. So can you tell us a little bit about. What happened from your perspective and and uh, and and why you, um, and what you then decided to do so the first phase was uh, on the six months and we had roughly in this um uh in this framework we were the, the neck uh we had to um to address five big topics that we identified um and so we organized the process around those five topics and we were aware in the, the beginning discussions that those topics touch each other. It's a complex thematic. Uh, we, we didn't have a small question. It was a very large question on the document that has uh, several hundred pages with all the annexes. And, and uh, so so quite complex to bring the, the, the topic to the people. Um, and, and in the first phase, so there was this, this deliberative democratic uh, process to have this diversity of the participants, which worked very well, this selection, in, in my opinion, and to get them on the same knowledge level to debate and to develop first solutions based on this structure we choose. But a lot of solutions, we saw them on different working weekends, that they were interconnected. It's a complex uh, topics, uh, which, which has connections everywhere. And so after the third weekend, uh, we decided together with the participants that to have deep enough knowledge and to to go into more interconnected solutions and not solving a problem which creates a problem uh, upstream or downstream it was necessary to have a second or third iteration and so we had to to decide uh, uh, to, to prolong the, the the process because uh, the six months were short and it just finished before the school holidays which made that a certain stress at the end would have been uh, bad for the quality of the the outcome. Can so I just say, so your 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 approach, because this is actually quite different from most assemblies. Your approach was to work with the whole assembly on a topic each weekend, uh, with the with it with the initial hope that no, you had to produce recommendations from each of those topics. Not totally. We had uh, pre calls uh, where we had experts bringing people up to speed. Uh, we had experts on the working weekends itself, and we had, so we worked in smaller groups on different topics, but we always wanted to have this democracy that at the end of the weekend, all the people deliberate on the solution that were uh, made in, in smaller groups. And we saw that this took a certain time because of the depths we, we needed and also the expertise and also the, the interesting views that the experts that were on the working uh, weekends itself brought inside the process when it was ongoing. And the other challenge was uh, working in four languages. Uh, so uh, during the weekends, it, it makes you a little bit slower. And we are used to work in Luxembourg with all those languages, but we based ourselves on studies of other uh, citizen assemblies in the other countries. And unfortunately, they are not in different languages. So for the next ones or for people who want to do them with more languages, it takes time, uh, real-time tra uh, translation, but also to deliver the reports. Uh, we couldn't deliver the report the, the day after. And so, yeah, we, we had some delays adding up uh, simply in the circulation of the informations, uh, always having them in, in several languages. Uh, also for the experts, uh, finding the right experts who have the expertise, but also fitting with the languages um, uh, was kind of a, a challenge that was specific to the Luxembourgish process. So, so 
uh, you know, my, my summary is you kind of got, you've gone through this process of, of five weekends of going through the various topics. You've started to sort of develop potential potential solutions and you work with the, you, you agree with the members to then do something to, to, to extend the work. And that now in the, in that first section which is very, I think quite familiar to us, you know, very much sort of facilitated process. I understand the second sec, the second session when section, when people started to develop their recommendations, that was much more self-organized compared yep. to the, okay. So could you tell us a bit about that? Cause that's a really unusual, an unusual step. So uh, we, we had a nice, yeah, we, we had a nice effect that after the second weekend, we already saw uh, a team building process that, that was going very fast. Um, and where well, we had a lot of people who immediately were focused on, on working together and finding solutions together. So on, on this side, we were faster than what we expected. And we capitalized on, on this one. Uh, and we pushed further on it during the next working weekend so that we really had groups that were uh, self-facilitating. Second point, which was interesting, uh, there were natural leaders who, who came in, in a sort of consensus. We didn't force this process and who already in the last working weekend really took the lead. And so we said, um, if they are autonomous in it, and our role, which uh, was given to us, was to, to interfere the less possible in the process and just what was necessary to, to get an outcome. And we saw that most groups were, were autonomous. We let them go by uh, a coaching a little bit from far. So we saw we were on the platforms where they communicated. We were on phone very often with the leaders of those teams, a little bit less with all the members of those sub teams. Um, so it was more a process of coaching the leaders uh, in their autonomy, uh, which also for us was uh, quite new or unusual. Um, but I think it was based on this urgency we started at the beginning, which made something all the people were starting at the same point in the process. And so uh, this team building phase was a chance that it, it, um, it, so it when, came when very about, naturally. You talk about le you talk about leaders. So so how were they? How was it decided who were the who would the leaders be? Did that did that come out of the assembly? Select them or? Yeah, we so we saw natural leaders coming, and at a certain point we formalized it with the with the assembly, just that it was clear and that this was not unformal leaders before we let them in the second phase. Uh, so that we also had a person, a spokesperson. Uh, we didn't name that leaders. It, it was leadership qualities we we saw and we searched. We named them spokesperson. And indeed, they made a, a job of a spokesperson, but they had leadership qualities. Um, and just to clarify, because I think it's important so um, for people to understand, as I understand it, the, the, the members could self-select into the groups and work on the particular topics yeah. that they want, because many assemblies will will decide that they will always use random selection, say, you know, randomly select a group of people to work on this, a group of people. You actually made the choice that people could go, could follow their interests, basically. Yep. Out of two reasons. Um, the first one, they all worked on the different weekends on the first deliberation. So on the, the rough propositions, uh, which were not, uh, not finalized. And everybody got... Uh, to, to the propositions or to the topic uh, which interested him most. And so we guaranteed that they, even though that the process was longer than, than asked uh, in the beginning, uh, they would be motivated to work on a topic that was interesting for them. Because we knew that they all had access to the different weekends and worked on every topic in the, the brainstorming and, and first facilitation phase. And we had this vote at the end of the process where everybody could amend and upvote or downvote the proposition. And so we saw which proposition uh, needed for perhaps a, a third iteration or some clarification where, because there were amendments and other proposals which were uh, voted by, by everybody because it made sense for, for everybody, even those who weren't working on the depths of this proposal. And one of the challenges we find in a lot of assemblies is making sure that when people come to vote, they actually understand the proposals that are coming because they they didn't work on them. Was that a challenge for you? Because if these groups are working autonomously, that must be really difficult. Obviously, but we had templates, uh, thanks to Philip and his team, uh, we had templates where we put it down. And from the beginning of the, the process, also in the facilitation, we worked with uh, big A1 or A0 templates 
and we always used the same template to to bring a proposal so there was a certain structure people knew already what is the the um, the problem what is the solution what are the the risk opportunities so the, the classical facilitation techniques but made very visual um nevertheless with the four languages in the translation uh different uh, things were not that clear and there were a lot of phone calls to clarify some things and certainly some people also communicated a little frustration to us uh because they would have wanted more details but on the other hand uh, we had more than 60 proposals uh we, we we couldn't make four pages per proposal it, it, it wouldn't have um, been too too complex again so we we try to have enough details but not to get lost into details and one point we always told people was we are not doing the legislative process we are bringing ideas sound ideas reflected ideas but we don't go on details of uh, feasibility with uh, VTO or uh, whatever rules. Uh, we put a red line somewhere in, in details where we said, okay, then this is now other people who will work with these ideas and make this, this uh, legislative process. And this yeah. helped to really reformulate this to the people, what was the objective, because often people at a certain point want to go further than what is asked in, in this assembly. That's fair. One thing I'm going to just jump, take this question now because it's relevant to what we're talking. Remco's just said, how did you ensure that there weren't internal power struggles or how did you ensure that the group dynamics actually worked when they're, when they're working autonomously? Because one of the things about assemblies is making sure there's a fair process. So how, how did you, if, if these groups That's are doing their own thing, how do you, how do you manage that? We had different dynamics, uh, but as I said, uh, each facilitator was assigned to one uh, spokesperson and to one group, and we were reading the messages that were on the platform, we were phoning with some people, we were listening what we got of, of information, and we interfered there where it was necessary, so it was nearly autonomous, but we were there uh, and, and uh, having an eye on it. And doing this work, all the facilitators have an, an experience with it. So at a certain point, you see at the tone of the emails, of the messages on the platform that you, you have to be a little bit more present. Uh, and, and it changed with the groups, with the dynamics. So we had five different dynamics at the end of the process. Uh, well, every every group, the, all that, every group is different, yeah. absolutely. Um, I've got a lot, we've got a lot of other people to get through. So I'm going to have to um, jump yeah. jump into a couple of questions I we, we maybe can save to later but one of the one of the challenges for the for for the Luxembourg process um, in terms of its relationship with e externally is that actually we can't find out anything about it there's a the, the website doesn't tell us who was involved you know doesn't tell us about how it ran doesn't tell us about the sessions doesn't tell us about what evidence was given do you kind of regret or is that maybe that was not your your thing? Do you regret that there, there's nothing there that kind of means that there's that there's any external transparency? Um, I'm perhaps not not the right person to, to <laughs> exactly see what's in the exterior because I was uh, in every step in depth in it. So um, it's it's difficult for me for to to judge um, in 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 depth of it. Most, um, most assemblies on their websites will have the list of the people who presented. Yeah. We'll have a list of what the sessions were. We'll have videos of what happened, etc. Yeah, I, I give three bre brief uh, views on it. Um, one is that we put due to the the, the deadline and, and starting very quickly, and also having all those working weekends very close to each other um to to have this expertise inside of the team so finding the experts making those visits those uh panel talks uh all those things and they were recorded and uh, uh put uh put online uh, as far as i know not not always in in real time but uh they were there and in the team building process and and in the team we very quickly uh had the climate citizen working on those proposals and and finding uh, a big motivation on, on on making proposition proposals which was one part what was asked to us and at the third weekend i think we had a, a formal vote if we were ready to go to the press or not because we didn't want it to communicate on behalf of the climate citizens and the climate citizens gave the priority to work and not to communicate and then we had an effect that uh by not communicating or, or which so have a reason there was some bad press coming around the the, the fourth working weekend which discouraged further i think spokesperson wanting to go public 
So we offered uh, spokesperson training, everything, but we didn't see our role as facilitators to communicate on behalf of the climate citizenship. Uh, sure. no, I, I understand. Yeah. I guess. I guess I was thinking more of just the sort of the basic structure of yeah. what happened and things like that, but that's fine. Yeah. I'm, gonna, I'm gonna save a, a question which you can think about towards the end, which is if you could do it all again, what would you what what would you do? But I'm, I'll, I'll ask you that at the end of the call. Okay. So we'll, we'll hold on to that one, Tom. I'll ask everyone that later. Tom, thank you. That was so that was so helpful, and we'll bring you back towards the end when we uh, when we when we bring you back as a panel. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> So I'm going to bring um, Jeff into the um, in Jeff Feller into the uh, conversation. Um, Jeff is the uh, chief of staff to the prime minister in um, in Luxembourg, um, and I think what's particularly um, interesting for me in, on this call, particularly as we're doing this work next week, if you're uh, we're doing a workshop on follow up, is that is it it was the chief of staff of the prime minister who was responsible for responding to this. So I'm I'm kind of interested. Um, Jeff, how did you end up with this job? I mean, it's kind of like usually, usually this is not something that's at cabinet level. So, uh, so, so how, how did how did it end up in your tray? And and uh, yeah. bit of a bit of the story behind that, perhaps. Yeah, thank you. Hello, everyone. Um, well, I, I can't really speak for my colleagues in in other countries that have uh, organized climate assemblies, but for me, in my opinion, it's not completely unlogical uh, that the chief of staff. Uh, is involved in such an uh, exercise um, because oh, well, in Luxembourg, yeah. as you, I just say, I don't think it's illogical. I think it's fantastic. I'm just saying. It's <laughs> yeah, I'm just yeah, saying it's but, but it, it, it might be unusual, but uh, yeah, like, like you have said in your introduction, it was the prime minister himself that has um, uh, proposed the uh, the climate assembly in his, in his uh, state of the nation uh, speech. And uh, it is quite an important project for him. So uh, he actually wanted to get involved in uh, climate uh, policy. And uh, it would really concerning if that uh, wouldn't be the case because uh, the fight against climate change is, yeah, it is the most important and urgent political issue uh, of our time. So it really uh, should be normal that the prime minister and uh, his staff are also getting involved uh, in this. And uh, as the chief of staff, well, it, it is my most important job to to do everything I can to make certain that the prime minister uh, can fulfill uh, his political agenda. And he has chosen to put the fight against climate change on top of uh, his political agenda. And uh, well, I think that that's the explanation why uh, I uh, got involved uh, in, in the process of uh, really uh, yeah, um, following up the recommendations because he wanted um, to make sure that uh, he stays on top of the uh, following up uh, and he really wanted to, to make sure that as many recommendations as possible are being implemented. So uh, that's uh, why he asked me to, to do that. Um, I didn't do it alone. Uh, I must uh, admit uh, my role was... Uh, was uh, could, you, could you tell us a little bit about what your team looked like? What kind yeah. of structures you put in place because I think this is really this is where a lot of assemblies fall down yeah. getting that is getting that process right yeah exactly and I, I to be honest I think the the most helpful thing in in my position being involved is uh, it, it really helps in a negotiation if you can tell your counterpart that the prime minister really wants something to be done and uh, <laughs> so so that that's actually I think the the the, the biggest uh, yeah benefit of of me being part of of, of this Okay, so so what so you said you work with other people, you work so so we've got we've got um, if I if I characterize this, you've got a you've got a set of recommendations that are coming out of the of the assembly. They are going to be considered as part of the national uh, uh, energy and climate plan. And then you've got a group of um you've got, you've then got various policy officials and policy teams around the around the um around your administration let's say some of which will be more reluctant than others to respond to the citizens so how do you, how do you create a structure that actually ensures that the assembly that, that the administration responds responds apart from you saying the prime minister wants it <laughs> yeah well first of all i i uh, we had a, a little bit the same issues as i think the uh, organizers and members of the Klima Bijerot themselves, uh, we had to work with quite a tight uh, time frame uh, because uh, the Climate Assembly has presented its recommendations in, in September. And uh, because of the 
uh, national climate and energy plan uh, that was the, the final goal of, of implementation uh, the government had to finalize the draft update uh, by april this year because uh, these time frames are given uh, by the european commission so you don't, don't have a lot of uh, margins there well uh, september until april that sounds like a lot of time but it really isn't um, because uh, uh, we have identified uh, 142, I think, uh, different uh, measures in these recommendations. So uh, these uh, 50 or so recommendations uh, can be, uh, well, they have uh, 142 different uh, measures uh, in them. And uh, it was quite some work to, uh, to really assess uh, uh, every one of, uh, of them. So how we, did we uh, do that? Um, the government actually responded the same day uh, as uh, the on, on the presentation of the of the recommendations by the Kimebejo, the government responded uh, and announced the, the creation of a task force, uh, a task force um, with members from the Ministry of State, so the Prime Minister's Office, the Ministry of the Environment, uh, Climate and Sustainable Development, and the Ministry of, of Energy. And uh, this task was co coordinated preparatory work um, and sent uh, all the uh, recommendations and uh, the, uh, the, the the work that has been done by the task force to the uh, responsible entities and we are speaking uh, about 24 entities uh, so ministries administrations and and so on that are responsible on on uh, drafting the uh, energy and climate uh, plan uh, of uh, of luxembourg so um yeah that that was the first step um uh, the uh, energy and climate plan is, is actually quite a uh, quite a technical document uh, with, with quite some uh, criteria by the uh, European leg legislation. Um, so the first step was actually to to um, yeah to to um, see which recommendations actually meet the criteria of the uh, climate and energy uh, plan and. Uh, half of them did so uh, 71 measures uh, could uh, theoretically be implemented uh, in the uh, energy and uh, climate plan and the other half uh, couldn't uh, so that was the, the worst uh, the, the first step um, but uh, that doesn't mean that we uh, we didn't uh, look at the uh, at the half that didn't uh, fit in the in the climate uh, and energy plan. I, I can perhaps we can come back to that uh, to that later. And uh, yeah, then uh, the, the work really began because uh, we had quite uh, yeah quite. Uh, um, quite a tough time frame to respect. Uh, every single measure had to be analyzed by the responsible entities. We had discussions going on in the interministerial working group. Um, and uh, yeah, the, the ambition was to, to implement as many as recommendations as possible. Uh, how did we do that? Uh, we, we tried to, um, yeah, we tried to, to actually uh, look at every single recommendation and uh, compare it to the policies that are already in place. Um, and uh, we classified all the recommendations in four different categories. Uh, we had some measures that we find have already been in place. Uh, we have some recommendations that uh, are similar to existing measures, but these existing measures could be strengthened. Uh, we had completely new measures uh, not um, not in place in Luxembourg, and we have measures that cannot be implemented directly uh, or implemented at all because of legal reasons or other reasons that uh, I can also explain perhaps a little bit uh, a little bit later. Um, yeah, so we that that was actually quite quite some work to do. We we then drafted a table, an Excel file, if you if you like, uh, where we put all uh, the uh, assessments uh, and uh, analysis of, of the of the working group, and we actually put a proposition for the government in there. And so we try to be as transparent as possible. You can actually look that table up; it is online. Um, and. Uh, we were quite confident to do it because the government has decided to follow all the proposals. So we had no uh, no difference between the the table drafted by the by the working group and the decisions uh, made by the by the by the government. 
Uh, and the government actually uh, took another interesting decision. Uh, they didn't really trust <laughs> all the analysis uh, of, the, uh, of the different entities. And if an entity um, has stated that a measure does already exist, uh, and it was proposed by the Klima Beja Road, that this existing measure is assessed uh, by the government uh, to check if it really is the same as uh, the <laughs> recommendation made by the Klima Beja Road. And that is actually still an ongoing uh, process. So we are still um assessing all the uh, all the measures uh, that are in place and all the measures that have been proposed by the Klima Beja Road and uh, yeah we are still uh, actually implementing new measures where the assessment is finalized and yeah for for some <laughs> for some measures that uh, were thought to be already existing we, we did find that no there there could be done uh, more and uh, so so this is is an interesting uh, uh, process still still ongoing Okay, and um, and did you bring um, members of the uh, assembly in at all to talk to them about about how this how this translation was happening? Did they have any role in yeah. that? Yeah, actually, um, uh, the the spoke people of the bureau they they uh, had the possibility to to present their recommendations to the prime minister and uh, the two other competent ministers. And the prime ministers made uh, the offer to actually organize meetings uh, between the spoke people and uh, uh, and yeah the, the responsible entities. And um, uh, if I am correct, then uh, some meetings have actually been organized. Uh, and uh, uh, I've been told that these meetings have helped uh, to facilitate the implementation of some measures. Uh, so where the the ministries could perhaps give some explanations uh, why um, a measure cannot be implemented 100% like it has been proposed by the Klima Beja Road, but there are alternatives. Uh, and uh, yeah, that, uh, I think that, that was quite an interesting addition to, to the process to, to let uh, the people that have made the propositions uh, speak to the people that are responsible in, in uh, implementing them. Okay, that's, that's, that's really helpful. And you, you mentioned that there are some which don't relate to the to the some of the rec half the recommendations actually you felt didn't relate directly to the NECP so they're they're being they're they're, they're continuing to be looked at or or have they been put to one side no they these ideas will, will not be lost actually they they will be included into other official official plans that are not the energy and climate a plan we have uh, dozens of of these plans actually they they uh, concern uh, uh, ways, sustainable development, uh, nature conservation, uh, etc. And uh, actually, we have an interesting example uh, of one such idea that uh, uh, falls in the scope of, of my ministry because um, the prime minister is uh, also a minister, minister for, for, the media, for media in Luxembourg. And um, yeah, um, we, we have actually uh, taken one uh, proposition made by the Klima Beja Road uh, and have integrated it into an agreement with media uh, outlets that uh, provides the public service. And uh, we have actually uh, created a mandatory coverage about the challenges of climate crisis in these public uh, media services. Uh, that was one proposition made by the Klima Beja Road, and we could uh, implement it within a few months after the uh, after the presentation of the Klima Beja Road uh, report. And uh, this is really an, an ongoing process. So uh, I have uh, talked about the assessment of already existing measures. Uh, we have. Uh, after we spoke last time, now nine additional measures that have been strengthened because of this assessment. We have uh, strategies, government strategies, uh, laws, uh, regulations that are updated because of the propositions made by the Klima Beja Road. Um, and I am very confident that this will go on, go on for, for a few months and years uh, so that uh, the work of the Klima Beja Road uh, goes way beyond uh, one single document. Uh, and, uh, yeah, it, it will be interesting to see uh, if uh, we'll uh, check in a few years uh, how, how, how many of these uh, recommendations uh, are in, 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 uh, in place. But uh, yeah, we, we are quite confident that uh, perhaps not all of them, but, but a big majority of them can be implemented. 
And and did you say there's a way that that you are regularly reporting on this, or is it is there is there public reporting on this as to as to what is what's happened to the assembly? Yes, yeah, we we try to update this uh, this Excel file I, I have mentioned, uh, and uh, yeah, these these all these documents, these strategies and laws, they they are public. Uh, uh, so uh, there, there are different procedures on how they are updated, um, but uh, yeah, the, the government uh, uh, that is uh, now in place, we have general elections in, in two weeks, but uh, the government that is now in place, they, well, they, they to be honest, they have an, an interest to, to be transparent about how they uh, implement the recommendations because it was, uh, the Clima Budget was a project that uh, has been um, yeah, broadly discussed in Luxembourg, and uh, you want to tell people if you implement uh, some of the yeah. ideas, uh, and let's not not talk about it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, that, yeah that, that's <laughs> it's kind of it's kind of interesting actually, because I think you've done the reverse in Luxembourg of what what we normally find, which is it's actually harder to find out information about what happened in the assembly. It's and it's actually quite easy to find out if what's happening within the public authority. It's kind of like a really, really strange way around, but that's great. Listen, this has been really great, Jeff, and I'll bring you back towards the end to ask you about your uh, lessons learned and some highlights. Uh, but thank, thank you so much for uh, for explaining uh, what you've done. It sounds like a real. I mean, there's a lot to learn from you. So thank, thank you for that. Thank you. Uh, and now I'm going to turn to uh, Marion. Uh, Marion was one of the uh, members of the assembly, and she's going to. Um, we've, we've just had the we've just had the um, official uh, explanation from the from the organisers and from the government of what they've done. And now we can uh, now now Marion, it's your turn to say what it was like to actually be part of it and to and to and to um, be be part of that, be, be a member of that process. Can you so could you tell us initially about? Why did you agree to participate, and, uh, and and what were your expectations when you when you received an invitation? Okay, why did I agree to participate? Well, generally, I think that every society needs volunteers, and more specifically, because I think the issue of climate change is a very important one, and I felt I could contribute there. Okay, okay. So, uh, and and were you okay? That that's that's really great, and so. We talked to um, Tom about this stage one and stage two of the process and the sort of um, the, uh, the, the the way that the first the first part of the process was quite facilitated. The second part was more self-organized. I'm kind of interested in the first part. You were asked to grapple actually the whole way through, I guess you asked to grapple with this with the with the draft of the um, National Energy and Climate Plan. I must admit, I've tried to read national energy and climate plans, and they are not the most interesting documents. So I'm kind of interested to know what your experience of engage of trying to engage with that with that challenge. What, what how did how did that how did that pan out for you? Well, it's a difficult document to read uh, because of its structure, which is given by the European Commission. Um, now, interestingly, your question addresses the national plan directly. But the task given by the prime minister to the KBR was not so clearly expressed. Namely, he said, can and will Luxembourg go further in the fight against climate change and uh, against global warming? And if so, how? But most members of the KBR seem to understand this as, can we go further than what we already see around us? The majority were not aware that the NECP was intended to be the basis from which to start. And when this was pointed out by some members in the first group session, others replied they did not have the time to read through a document of some 200 pages. And when made aware during group consultations that the measures they proposed were already part of the NACP, the answer was often, okay, but we think it's an important issue anyway, and that should be emphasized. So I had the impression people were brainstorming all sorts of ideas without paying much attention to the NECP. This made discussions rather ineffective, I must say, and progress difficult. So it is clear members were not on the same page regarding the tasks given to them when starting discussions. I think there would have been the need to organize this. You know, uh, when, when signing up for the Climate Assembly, it was stressed that you didn't need, you didn't have to have any prior knowledge. But then 
we should have been introduced to the national plan beforehand. So I think introducing each weekend topic should not only have been by expert presentations, but by addressing specifically the relevant national plan sections and allowing them to be discussed in the groups to be understood really. Okay. Now, second point concerning the expert presentations, which introduced each topic, they were very interesting, but they were not well adapted or not at all to the non-specialist audience and did not do much to elucidate the subject for the majority of participants. Uh, I found that there were a few questions asked and always by the same bunch of people. And uh, group discussions didn't take too much account of the info presented. Furthermore, those presentations usually explained achievements in the field, pointed out problems and gave an outlook for further work. But what they did not do was they did not show and discuss possible realistic solutions for better climate measures, together with their implications for society, for ordinary people like us, which would have enabled our members to make informed choices about which changes we as citizens would or would not wish to put up with. I mean, honestly, how can ordinary non-specialist people be expected to come up with miracle solutions to the immensely complex subject at hand? That is ridiculous. What we need are expert recommendations, well explained to choose from. And in this context, we would also have liked to invite a greater diversity of speakers. The speakers were mostly scientists, government officials, heads of industry. Then my third point is concerning the organization of the consultations during the week working weekends. I described what I experienced, and that may not have been the same in every group. But in my group, it was like this. Well, first of all, the 60 people were split into groups of 15 by language. We didn't have to speak all three languages, but one of them at least. Group facilitators then gave instructions to members with time indications in minutes. Write your idea on a post-it sticker, five minutes. Present it, two minutes. Discuss and develop an idea with your subgroup, 20 minutes. Fill in the template about this proposal, 20 minutes, etc. Members were divided into smaller subgroups by the facilitator, no choice. Also, members were assigned ideas to develop from the pool, ideas they had neither proposed nor chosen. It felt like being in a classroom of seven-year-olds and having to oblige the teacher. Well, then, in contrast, seemingly to lighten up the proceedings, playful elements were introduced, games which took too much time and were not appreciated by the members. Several members protested. This straitjacket organization would certainly not engage the best competences of the members. Some of us talked to and wrote to the organizers. I wrote a four page letter. These thankfully, the organizers were flexible enough and the micromanaging of the work subsided. Improvements were made and we got on better. But these difficulties could have been avoided and a lot of valuable time saved if members had been involved in the planning and organization of the consultative process. So to sum it up, the KBR work in phase one was fraught with obstacles and did not lead to presentable recommendations as intended. The recommendations were very rudimentary, were partly overlapping because there were four groups on the same subject. Partly, they were even contradictory. That's why we asked for a prolongation, later term phase two, to revise the rough proposals from the working weekends uh, into a presentable form. Okay, so I, 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 um, I, I didn't know how to, I didn't know how to break in and ask you a question during that. So <laughs> but that was, that's, it's fine. So. Um, but what's re what's really interesting for me is the way that the I mean you, you've described you've described some of your frustrations with the process, but actually the 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 that you felt that the 
facilitators were res responded to that and altered it. But then you're, you're talking about this second phase, which clearly, given given what you said about the first phase and not and not enjoying the sort of highly structured process, was the second phase for you a more constructive phase? Then this idea of sort of self-organized groups and that actually working in working much more on particular topics that that was that 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 for you was a more productive part of the process was it oh it definitely was yes uh, we in in the second phase then we split into thematic groups each participant now being able to choose the subject of greatest interest to them and each group was led by one or two or three speakers who had volunteered and were then confirmed by vote. And wait, were you were you one of those? Yes, I was. Okay, okay. In and my that, 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 exper that experience of actually trying to lead a group through this, that was something that you, you, you felt worked well? Yes, I can describe that a little if you wish me to. Uh, I could describe how it worked in, in my group and it was maybe not the same, but similar in other groups. So in my group, we started by reviewing the proposals from phase one, the proposals concerning our topic energy. And we decided which ones to follow up and which ones would be passed on to other groups. We could arrange the proposals into three subtopics and then split up uh, into three subgroups accordingly. And that was all done in a consensual way using the online platform provided by the organizers. The speakers then took the lead in drafting proposals. That was quite natural. That, uh, and uh, we discussed and developed them first in the subgroups and then in the whole group. That was all done using private Zoom, email, chats, and phone. We never met in person. Okay. The discussions were friendly and focused. However, this was a long and difficult part as many questions and objections had to be clarified and references searched and so on. But everyone could contribute as much or as little as they wanted. Speakers tried to be positive. I was not the only speaker in my group, we were three. Uh, so we tried to be positive, encourage others. Nevertheless, only half of the members stayed active. And I think to a large extent probably owed to it being holiday time, July and August. Yeah. Also, the active members were on holiday in various weeks, and we had Zoom and WhatsApp calls all over Europe and beyond. The experts, unfortunately, only were available in principle, but mostly not in practice during that period, because we were promised that we could ask them questions, but they were not available. And yet, we really wanted to make this a success. So we made time for it, a crazy number of days and evenings. and. I believe we could present well-founded recommendations. Yep. Okay. So, so do you just reflecting back? So, your your experience of the first part, where you felt it was too facilitated, and this experience of your your latter. I'm assuming that you couldn't have just gone straight to the kind of self-organization because you, you would have needed to have some process where you where you where you're uh, developing your learning etc so so looking back looking back how would you have wanted the first the, the first uh the first element of the process to work how, how could it have been improved do you think i think it was not bad it was good to let everyone have uh, a say on all the subjects and also to introduce all the subjects to everyone that was quite a good idea but it would have needed an, an introduction and a preparation, you know, with the PNEC, as I pointed out. Uh, we would have needed at least, or let's say, one weekend of, of introduction that would have been, yeah, would have saved us a lot of problems, I think. Okay, okay, that's, that's really helpful. And my, and my last question is, I'm just interested about um, the role that spokespersons and other assembly members have played afterwards, both in terms of engaging with the with the government and, and also um, in terms of um, in terms of other activities that they may be involved in. Can you tell me a little bit about that? Uh, well, the spokesperson, you, you can't invite 60 people or 100 people <laughs> easily, you know, so we were 15 uh, spokespeople. And so we were invited to we were the ones who, who were invited to the prime minister's office to present uh, 
the recommendations and we would then also present the recommendations to the press and to the parliamentary committees um, and and we were invited to uh, the ministry my group was invited twice to the ministry of energy uh, once by the highest ranking official there and once by the minister himself and well you think that uh, that means there's a, a genuine desire for exchange with citizens but my expectation that our proposals would be discussed did not come true Instead, we learned a lot about the history of CO2 emission reduction efforts in Europe on the first occasion and about current and future efforts of the ministry regarding renewables in the second meeting, which was interesting. But I asked myself all the time, why do they do this? Yeah. What do they get out of it? Is that what politicians have to do to be seen to engage? I don't know. I'm not a politician. I was trained as a scientist and to me the meetings did not make much sense because we weren't advancing on the subject of our proposals so yeah so so um now that we've we're actually starting to see some of the outputs of the that some of the recommendations being moved into policy i are you are you pleased with the degree of response or are you disappointed or or are you still waiting or are you still still waiting to judge I'm I'm better not judging on the on the other subjects that I wasn't uh, too closely involved in, but the energy subject. Uh, let's take as an example the our proposal to increase the um, tax for CO2 emissions to 200 euro per ton, uh, and in the in the previously existing PNEC uh, it was 20 euros plus five euros per year uh, and that stayed the way okay so, so so you haven't seen change on that okay it, okay. it was it was now in the new PNEC it was extended for the next years which was not written in the in the last version of the PNEC but is that a great achievement I mean five euros per year for a ton of uh, co2 emissions that means uh, for the petrol you buy at the at the station it means one cent or 1.1 cent perhaps is you know that is uh, smaller than the fluctuations of the of the daily price okay. it fair. doesn't mean much Okay, well, Marion, thank you so much for your uh, for your insights and your and your honesty about the uh, about the experience. And uh, we'll bring you bring you back later. Thank you, thank you so much. And and finally, I'm just going to turn to Raphael. Um, Raphael is a uh, he works. At, he's a, um, a, a are you a professor or a lecturer? I don't know, uh, Raphael. Sorry, uh, at the uh, whatever. I'm a researcher, teaching. Yeah. I think <laughs> he does everything. At the, he 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 does everything at the University of Luxembourg. But he's leading the research team, and I'm just kind of interested. Um, you you have you've been um, given actually really unenviable uh, um, un un get, get the right round enviable access to to the process. You've been involved. Uh, you sat on the advisory group. You've kind of seen the process evolve over time. I'm just wondering what your main what your main reflections are about the process. What you think went well, and what you think could have could have could have gone better. Some of it may have come out on this call. So, and I'm I'm thinking about the process right the way from the president and uh, the, the 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 prime minister announcing it through to what's actually happening at the moment within the administration. So, so what are your thoughts, Raphael? I've got a short presentation, but if you prefer, we can talk like that. Uh, let's talk. It's better if we talk, I think. Well, we just talk. Yeah. So, what went well? I took some points to, but it was excellent to have uh, Marion presenting also a more skeptical view and, and not that everything went perfectly well because it's normal. This is a, yeah. a set with human beings. It was the first time that it was realized in Luxembourg. So, there's a learning process that is uh, unavoidable. And, uh, and, and I think it's perfectly fair to, to, to say. It. So I took some point that, according to me, went quite well, uh, at least from the data that we received. First of all, the quality of deliberation was considered to be quite good. Uh, facilitator did a, a great work. Language was not too much a problem. As it was mentioned, uh, you had to add the passive knowledge of three languages, but just the active knowledge of one language. So uh, it was not so exclusionary, but there was an inclusive effect. 
knowing as well that we had half of the population that is foreigner and that we had also people from abroad, working abroad, uh, that also came uh, to, this, uh, to this process. Uh, we, we noticed as well that people who participated gained knowledge, that's, that's for sure. And in particular, as Marion was saying, we have a special data on that, where you ask at the beginning, what do you know about uh, the PNEX or the, the, the National uh, Plan on Energy? Uh, and we see that at the beginning, they didn't know much about it. And indeed, that, that was a, a good point. Uh, but later on, uh, if we look at the data, uh, the, the knowledge has increased and we've got almost 70% that say uh, that they got a good knowledge about the PNEX. So there was a good uh, learning, learning process. Uh, I was quite impressed by the way it was organized. You know, there was a lot of in-situ organization. Uh, there was the research of a lot of uh, experts. There was a certain uh, flexibility in the organization, so that was positive because indeed there were moments where there were difficult moments, but uh, the organization and also we as an advisory group we would try to find a solution to adapt also to the need of the citizen because when there was insatisfaction, we went back to them and we looked together what can be changed and what can be improved. So it, it was not a rigid process. For me, that was something uh, good. Uh, and. In relation to that, there was a good and constructive relationship between the government, the organizer, the citizens, and the advisory council. I think this was very important to have a sort of governance board that could work together in a complementary way and not one dominating the other, but really trying to find a solution together. Another thing that was extremely positive was the media. The media talked a lot about the process, also some were very critical about it, but it, it was not a process that uh, uh, went uh, on remark in the population. It was There was a high visibility of the process. I think we had more than 100 articles about it with some peak at the beginning and, uh, uh, and at the end uh, of, of the process. So the media coverage was really good. Uh, what is quite uncommon as well, uh, uh, I think in other processes, is how much the MPs, so the, the, the deputy were interested in the process, how much the government was interested in the process so that people could go at uh, uh, several ways, several times at the parliament, in, in parliamentary commission, to talk directly with the prime minister, to talk with the ministry. I don't know many countries where this is possible. So even if there can be some frustration that, you know, your proposal has not been taken one to one, at least you have the opportunity to present it, to talk it. And then obviously there is a, a sort of political compromise and uh, a political decision. but you had a voice and that, that's, that's for sure. Uh, and uh, we also noticed uh, a quite good support of parties. Uh, if we look at the opinion of parties, uh, we know that the major parties are in favor of continuing this type of process and also the public. The public, we, we did a broad survey, a panel survey about the broad public and the, the public tends also to support and would like to continue to have this type of process, not only on, on climate, but also on other topics. They would die in favor of continuing. So there was a good impact with regards to the public. Um, Rafael, can I ask you a quick question about that? Because there was a question actually someone just po po just um, asked, which was, have any of the other political parties, um, have, have any of the other political parties taken up any of the recommendations from the KBR as part of their, because you, you've got an election coming up at the moment. Is it is there is there any discussion of the KBR and it's, um, I think uh, some, I mean, after there were communal election, and I found interesting that some candidate put, you know, as reference member of uh, KBR. So they also put it as a sort of, I was member of KBR and now I'm, I'm doing politics. And uh, I will not be able to tell you in detail if in the political programs there were specific measures about the KBR, but they were discussed these measures. They were present in the public, uh, in, in public sphere. And the per measure that Marion is mentioning, uh, even you know about the C CO2 taxes, it was discussed in the public. So there was some criticism about, okay, the KBR wants to, to tax much more, why don't you do it? So it's even if it has not been taken, it has triggered uh, a debate. For me, this is already uh, an impact. Okay, okay, and and uh, you're a researcher, so you've got to you've got to have some things where you think it could have been better in terms of particularly. Uh, yeah, I, no, I guess. Yeah, that... There are many things that uh, uh, that, that could have been gone better. So I, I pointed some someone. First of all, it's the selection of participants. Uh, we noticed that from a social demographic profile, it was quite good with compare with regard to the population, but from the viewpoint of considering 
climate protection as a top priority or also the fact of supporting the Green Party, uh, there was clear and overrepresentation of participants compared to the general population that considered climate as a top priority or that have a preference for the Green Party. So obviously this is uh, a, a problem uh, in the in the selection that can be improved probably. So in in, in um in the UK and in Scotland, they had a question which actually asked people about their attitude towards climate, whether they you know had whether they were concerned or not. Do you think that's the sort of thing that you need to introduce if you're going to make sure that you have a good spread? Yes, I mean it is, and I saw some uh, preferences and behavioral elements in the. In, but then it's going to be much more difficult to get people. Because obviously, if you want one person to get involved six months or 12 months, 10 months, they must have an interest in the topic and they must feel it as an important topic. And usually, uh, people that feel that climate issue is important, it's people that want to change and to do, uh, to, to change it. Uh, so it's, it's I, don't, I don't say it's easy. Yeah. We know how difficult it is to get people involved. You can use a different type of incentive, but you should try to. To make uh, it work because this is the first criticism yeah. that you will get and it's the, easy, it's, it's the easiest criticism as yeah, well the yeah, mini yeah. public is not representative yeah, yeah, yeah. And, yeah. and it's a fair criticism i mean your mini publics tend not to be it's represent you can have it's present representative from a social demographic perspective but if they're not representative from the viewpoint of their preferences uh, it's it's obviously an issue uh, a second one that is related to this one, and that was also present in, in the survey we did, it's there were not sufficient critical voices or climoskeptical people participating. This is related to the to the first one. Um, as, uh, as, Marie, um, as Marianne was saying as well, some participants dominated the debate, which is something that we always see in, in all the processes. Another way problematic. And we needed to find solutions how to deal with these problematic individuals, uh, and some solutions were, were found uh, at the end. But I think this is quite common in all the uh, consultative uh, process. Um, Marian pointed out as well the selections of experts was a problem. So there were plenty of experts that were selected, according to me, also very competent expert. But only 42% of the participants consider that the expert reflect different point of view. Mm. But that's a positive aspect. 90% consider that overall that overall meeting with expert is a good thing for the quality of career work. So experts were considered to be useful, but there were not enough representation in particular of experts, of NGOs, university professors, but an overrepresentation from uh, civil servants. But we know why. We know why, because we, we discussed that also, because it was extremely difficult in a small country like Luxembourg to find experts in uh, in the different domain in, in a search in, in such uh, uh, with not in, uh, having so few time to to, yeah. to 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 search for them. And I must say, from my perspective, were uh, quite fair in, in the way they were presenting the expertise. They did not take the position of the government. But obviously, they are suspic suspicious that they could take the position of the of the government. Uh, I think I think this fits with my earlier question, I guess, about the lack of transparency of the process for people looking from outside as well, not being able to know who's to, who's participating. It's yeah, really well, that's, that's another point. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, the, yeah. The, the, the the process should have been the the process should have been more transparent saying how the process has been organized. There was nothing tried because it was a process that was very seriously professionally organized, but that was, I think also a question of human resources and time also to, to communicate uh, outside. But through the report that we're doing with, I should say that a lot of work was done by Emilian Police that is here, you will get all the detail. November we will present the, um, uh, the final uh, the final report. So you, you just you just cut out for a second. Then I think you said November you'll be releasing the final. Yeah, yeah. The the, the twenty second of November we will release the and you are invited as well, Grant. So you know it. You will release the final. Uh, the the, the final. Oh, Raphael, we're just having a bit of a problem with your connection. Um. Okay, I think. It's working. Yeah, it's okay. It's okay. We're we're, we're going to stop there anyway. And what I'd like to do is to bring the. Bring the panel back together if that's possible so if we could um 
bring Tom, Jeff, Marion and Raphael into the space, that would be great. Um, I've got a couple of um, I've got a couple of uh, questions that I've picked up, but there may be um, others want to come in. Um, one was, and, and I'm not sure who's actually in a in a position to um, explain this, but one was about the um, sortition process. Raphael, you may or, or Tom, you may be in a position to explain this, but um, there was there was one of the criticisms of it was not the criticism that Raphael was saying about the um, about getting people who are sort of climate, um, you know, about, about ensuring good, sorry, ensuring that we've got the range of preferences, but actually there were some problems with the sortition process itself uh, and that that was criticized. Do, do either of you have anything that you can add to that at all? Tom, do you have anything? I think Raphael's, uh, Raphael is, uh, is having a connection problem. By, by design, we were out of the selection process uh, because it was not our role and it was clearly separated. Um, so I, I'm i not the, the most appropriate person to, to answer. Okay, I'm really sorry. We seem to be having some connection problems. I think Luxembourg's, Luxembourg's Wi-Fi may have gone down. Can you hear me? Yeah, I'm back as well. Yeah. Yeah, I think we have a storm. Go we have yeah, a storm going on here. in Luxembourg. Might, that might be the problem. Ah, okay. okay. <laughs> so I was wondering if any of you, if it, um, is is Raphael back at all? Raphael, do you know anything about the problems that were had in relation to the sortition? Because I understand it was a mix of. Um, yeah, there was a, uh, um, it was a three methods combined. Uh, one was the panel uh, of uh, TNS Ilves, so the the survey company. Uh, that uh, they ask invited people from the panel who want to participate. Then there was an open invitation to not anybody who was interested to participate. And then they call, I think, 100, uh, 1,500 people by phone uh, to ask if they, were, if they wanted to participate. We don't know the proportion of who came from which method, but we, we suspect that largest part of the people came from the invitation process. So people that auto-select them because they're interested and not that many from uh, uh, a random phone call asking them to participate. But I think Emilia is on the room. So maybe if I forgot something, he can he can uh, add it. No? Okay, that, that was it, yeah. Yeah, no, I, th I think it's a real, and it's, so so it's a, it's actually a reasonable criticism that it could have, that it could have been done in a, in a, in a, in a, in a I mean, it is certainly the transparency issue again, because I, I talked to the person from the polling company, said all the data has now been destroyed for privacy reasons, et cetera, which struck me as very strange because usually this is all produced. But um, but yeah, so so I think that's an area perhaps that that, that could be developed over. But time. again, they had to, to act in a very tight time frame. So they didn't have much time. That could also explain why they relied so much on the invitation uh, of uh, their panel and uh, and the open call. And, and then see all the people who received the questionnaire in order to avoid to to have the social demographic representation and to be sure that they are not activists or involved in politics, so that, that there was some filter that were there. Okay. Um, Mark, who's uh, from the Danish Board of Technology, are there any um, is there anybody you want to bring in to actually ask a question, or is there or do you want to summarize some of the summarize some of the questions that have come out so that we can put those to the panel? Yeah, I think uh, Remco had a particularly interesting question, and I think it might be relevant to hear from different perspectives on the answer for this. Um, so Remco is talking or asked a question that has to do with the independence of the assembly. So the um, government and and Jeff, thank you for your um, for the hard work that you're doing on this. It's really interesting to see how much the government has picked up on it. But Remco's question, I think, is a curiosity as to how much you were actually involved in the process. So there's, of course, a critical eye to that. Was it an independent process or were you also involved when the recommendations were being drafted and the work was being done? Yeah, thank you for that question. We, we actually uh, didn't get involved uh, except for one time when the decision was made to, um, to prolong the, the process, the, the project. So when uh, the members asked for more time, uh, we, uh, myself, I was uh, present in uh, at the beginning at one, uh, one workshop uh, to discuss the different options with the with the members. Uh, why uh, did I get involved at that uh, time? Because 
uh, we had to adjust our uh, uh, internal proceedings uh, procedures uh, on uh, when uh, the parliamentary hearings uh, will be organized and so on. But uh, for the rest, we stayed out of it. So we weren't present for the uh, discussions, presentations, and uh, the deliberations. That uh, also is uh, true for the ministers. So the the first time the members of the Klima Visual got in touch with the with the ministers was when they presented uh, the recommendations to the prime minister. So can I just clarify that because I, I I I'm that maybe with you with you Jeff, but I understood that the that the there was coordination on a weekly basis between the Ministry of State and the, and Tom and his and the court. So wasn't there a kind of like a yeah, Tom, that's a bring bring you yeah. in. Um, th this coordination is based on the on the state's rule for budget. Uh, so every budget we engaged. So in these discussions, we mostly discussed about uh, which caterer, the place we choose, if it fits the fits the budget, um, and so on and so forth. And secondly, um, the 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 only um, topic related was on some experts, as Jeff said before. Um, if we have uh, and can say the ministry or the, the, the government is behind, we want you as expert, um, it's easier to get a uh, quick access. Um, so there we use this card, but the, the main uh, weekly meeting was on, on logistical and budgetary issues. And on issues because of GDPR, uh, some participation, we didn't have all the data of the, um, the citizens. So if somebody... Uh, wanted to switch because he had some family issues or whatever didn't could come to the weekend to choose who will be the replacing person we didn't see the demographic criteria or whatever social criteria where the people were chosen for gdpr measures so we knew this one can't come the next weekend and we asked the ministry who is the one who can replace according to your decision tree because we were the one doing the active part, <laughs> the ministry had the information. So it was based on those things. And some weekly meetings took a lot of space, but often we were quickly through it because there was no content discussion. It was just formal validation due to the state, the, the budgetary rules mainly and the GDPR rules, um, which we had to respect. Okay, that's really good. Um, Jeff, I just wanted to ask you why, um, well, well, maybe you can't say anything because you're not, you're, because of your political position, but, um, Maybe other people want to comment on this, but one of the things that seems to have come out of this is the is the idea that that this is something that you would like to see repeated, whether on climate or on other issues. Uh, is is that something that you that you see as 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 a serious development that this become, could become a more a more constant part of of Luxembourg politics? Yeah, actually, I can comment that because uh, Parliament has held a debate on that topic a few months ago. Uh, and uh, well, the, the prime minister was present for that debate, uh, and uh, well, welcome the outcome of the Klima Birger Road. Uh, we are waiting for the report uh, of the university to actually learn from the mistakes, and I also want to uh, thank uh, Marion uh, for for her honest opinion uh, on what uh, went wrong or could have been better, because that's really useful for, for us to to learn from the mistakes we made and we we made some mistakes i want to be clear clear on everybody, that. everybody makes uh, stuff. <laughs> and, and, uh, the, the first mistake we made was uh, and it was mentioned uh, a few times now was was the, the time frame we we didn't allow enough time for the preparation the organization and uh, and the actual uh, process but uh, for uh, i'm coming back to, to your question yes actually uh, luxembourg politics uh, all agree on the need of more uh, citizens, uh, uh, in, engaging citizens in a more active way and uh, yeah, on, on repeating uh, this, uh, this sort of, of, of uh, uh, citizen uh, council. So that, that is a thing that I think we will see uh, more of in, in, the, in the coming months and years. Brilliant. That's really interesting. Marian, as someone who's been through a process, do you think there should be more citizens assemblies in uh in Luxembourg? Um, you're, 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 you're muted. Yes, I think there should be, uh, because uh, making a little cross once every five years is not enough for a democracy, I think. Uh, and it would be good if we could find some 
good way of uh, letting the people in power know what uh, the ordinary people, what society uh, is thinking and is, is suggesting. And um, yeah, I think it was, despite all the shortcomings, it was a good experience. And I heard from other members as well that uh, they found it was a really good experience. It was very generous of the government to uh, organize those uh, invitations to fantastic places. I always wanted to see a windmill from inside or, <laughs> you know, I would have paid for this and instead we got paid. That was perhaps also a bit exaggerated. It can attract the wrong people or the people for the wrong motives. Um, but it was a fantastic experience to be part of it. And it's, I think that is not only my opinion, that's for most people, they would say it was I, well worth it. I, I can perhaps comment on the last uh, uh, remark there. We wanted to give the members of the Klima Beja with the same amount of money uh, members of parliament get uh, in their in their commissions. So that, that was the reasoning behind uh, the uh, amount that uh, was given to the members of Klima Bijo. So if that was too high, Marion, perhaps the members of parliament are paid too much in Luxembourg. <laughs> I, think it's really, I think it's actually really, I think the, the, the general consensus in this, on, on assemblies is that is that you need to pay people in order to, in order to, otherwise it's only going to be a very particular type of person who's got particular resources who's actually able to get into the assembly. I think there's a kind of a recognition of that. And a really interesting point that's been made by um, Magali here actually is one of the really interesting things about an assembly is that it's, it, it engages residents of Luxembourg and not just, not just those people who've got the right to vote, which I think is a really interesting, interesting point because, you know, they're, they're, I think the point there was about half the population don't vote, you know, don't have voting rights within Luxembourg. So it, it actually brings a different voice into the, into politics, into politics as well. So I'm going to, I'm just going to ask you all, um, because I, I, I always like to do this because I think it's a nice way to, to end these sorts of things about, about what was your, what was your, what's your highlight of this process been? Uh, looking back at it, you know, kind of what, what's the thing that you, that, that, that really kind of, and that, that could be something that you, you know, sort of, uh, it, it can be, uh, it can be the most bizarre thing, but I'm kind of interested about what, what, what's your highlight of actually having been involved in, involved in this? So, so Tom, what was it, what, what, tell us a bit about what your highlight was. Singling out one only highlight <laughs> is difficult. Um, but first of all, thank you to the government to, to put in place such a process uh, on the national level uh and and trusting uh the different uh, stakeholders uh to be dynamic uh because the target was a little bit moving and participation means also adaptation in my opinion uh, so that from a um, more directive way in the beginning we we let loose more and more which was not planned in the beginning um Secondly, I'm proud of uh, having seen all those people, so, so proud of the participants, who involved much longer than planned because it didn't stop in October for most of them. As was said before, stated before, they we saw them back, we, we got together with them to the different ministries, and still there are some initiatives coming out of this uh, citizen assembly, even some people engaging themselves now in politics who before uh didn't pay attention to the, their voice get get heard so i think on on this level it has a real impact on those 100 participants um perhaps rafael can say what it has on the global population but at least on those 100 participants we had a, a real impact and i think everybody came out with learning some people were more frustrated because they came already there with a certain knowledge and a certain level but we had to to walk a, a narrow path uh, because we had people who had difficulties to read this mass of information to to get this access to to research information and everything so it was always a trade-off with us but at the end i think everybody grew in the process and everybody was frustrated at some point some people were frustrated in the beginning because they didn't understand all the information others were frustrated because it was not hard enough um, but in the end, most people uh, shared with us some experiences and, and some learning and some growing on their part. 
And I think all of those have an, an, a radiation on their close community. And we'll discuss different about, about climate. And this brings me that uh, such an experience has to be repeated. Uh, we don't change with 60 persons the whole country, but they will change small, their peer groups. And, and this is a real impact we, we had with it. Thank, thank you, Tom. Jeff, what was your highlight sitting from the, you, you come from a very different perspective sitting in government. So I'm kind of interested to know what your highlight of the process has been. Those are my personal highlights, uh, if I, I may so, but uh, my, my first highlight was uh, really the quality of the recommendations made by the Klima I, I can, I, I think I can speak for, for, for the government and, and the Prime Minister, who I've spoken to a lot about the Klima he, he also was really impressed by the amount of recommendations and the quality of them. So despite all the difficulties uh, in, in the beginning, uh, they really did a fantastic job uh, uh, with the report they presented uh, to the public. And uh, the second highlight uh, really was uh, how we can see uh, the impact of the Klima Beja Road on uh, climate policies in, in Luxembourg. Not only the, uh, the implementation of the recommendations in the, in the uh, uh, energy and climate plan, but uh, also the impact on the uh, yeah, the political debate in, in Luxembourg, you can clearly see that um, the members of the Klima Bejo, they, they didn't only, uh, they didn't only, they, they, they didn't only uh, say that they are ready to accept a more ambitious uh, climate uh, policy, but they actively demand it. And uh, that's, that, that really had some impact in government dis discussions, in parliament discussions, and also in, in yeah, in, in, in general discussions in, in, in the political landscape in Luxembourg. And that uh, was quite a highlight to, to, to see. Great. That's, that's, thank you so much, uh, Jeff. Raphael, I'm going to give the last word to Marion. So you, you, what, what was your highlight? And you're, we can't hear you. you. You're doing the classic Zoom thing. We all, we all do it. Well, what was said before is obviously an highlight. Uh, for me, always in this process, there's this element of human adventures, of people coming together, of all ages, of all backgrounds. And you could see young people extremely motivated and concerned about the, the future and uh, really putting a lot of energy and, and ready to adapt. So that was a first highlight. Uh, and then from a, a more general institutional perspective is, is to see that Luxembourg, which is usually described as a sort of conservative, traditional country, a bit not a first mover, could be a sort of pioneer really also in, in transforming his participative institution and in introducing in an institutional way deliberative processes uh, and could be an example for other countries. And I think that for us in Luxembourg, this is a big change compared to the uh, old Luxembourgish politics that tended to be more conservative and, and, and traditional. So uh, it's a very positive, we're in a very positive trend on, on that regard. So for me, that would be my, my highlight. And just just to just to add a comment on that, because if you it, it won't be very long if you run it, if you run a, a number of assemblies, it won't be very long until most people know someone who has been in an, been invited to an assembly or been in an assembly. You know, the smaller population you have actually means that this can resonate much more quickly than in, than in larger populations. So, Marion, I give you the final word in terms of what was your highlight of the process. Right. So first highlight was, of course, handing in the finished proposals. That was a good release. <laughs> Finishing your work. <laughs> uh, and I must say, it was twice that I was on the brink of jumping off the, the bandwagon. Um, right. The real highlight to me, OK, there, there were the presentations, of course, to the prime minister, to the ministries. But to me, the real highlight was the presentation uh, to the parliamentary committees because they had questions, they wanted to know more background, they confronted us with certain problems and effects at implementation, uh, etc. So it was a really good, serious discussion. And yeah, that was definitely for me a highlight. So actually, so in, in a way, actually being taken very seriously is uh, yeah. that's, 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 really that's what it felt like, yeah. That's, that's really exactly. Fantastic. And then there was an unexpected highlight uh, in the end that was the reception at the Grand Duke. <laughs> yeah, it, but this amounted, for me, this amounted to a recognition of our work, free from political intentions, but highlighting the necessity for action. That was great. And that did give me some hope for the future, just okay. as well as Jeff with his report on how seriously the government takes all our propositions. Thank you, Jeff.
Well, on that note, I'd like to um, I'd like to thank Tom. I'd like to thank Jeff. I'd like to thank uh, Raphael. I'd like to thank Marion. I think we um, that was a really helpful call because I think you were all willing to talk about some of the limitations of the process as much as some as much as the successes of it. Um, I'm really I always um, am admire anyone who who takes on a project like this because I don't think anyone knows until you've done it quite how much work it takes um, and how much it ages you but uh, but it was a, a really fantastic I want to apologize to the audience we weren't able to get through all of the questions I tried to integrate some of them into the discussion um, so and just finally um, so 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 thank you everybody uh, so, so thank you for for, for a fantastic uh, event and I just finally like to uh, remind you that we actually have another workshop next week uh, and really interestingly, after those discussions with Jeff, it's about the it's about how we can make the follow up to assemblies uh, more effective. So that's obviously the theme for this month is uh, is the question of follow up. Um, but finally, once again, thank you for the for the panelists and thank you for to my colleagues at the Danish Board of Technology for uh, supporting uh, this uh, this learning call. Uh, it's been a pleasure to spend uh, an hour and a half with you, and I hope you've enjoyed it. Take care. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you.